still wait and make sure before she lets herself fall for Mikhail. Tetushka nodded. Does it seem in Nina's character to look to someone else for strength or companionship? Maybe for strength or companionship, but not for a relationship when she still loves Pasha, Annie replied. Clara jumped in. Not under normal circumstances, but I think war can change people. I mean, if I were alone and scared and a nice, handsome soldier was always helping me and my family, you can't really say what you would do unless it happened to you. Just reading what war was like, Annie added, makes me see how lucky we are that we've never had to live through things like that. I have been feeling sorry for myself that I lost my family, but I still have a nice aunt and a warm home with food, and you two for friends. Nina lost her family and her best friend, and people are freezing and starving all over Russia. You're right, Annie, Tetushka replied. We need to remember to be thankful for what we have, rather than focus on what we don't have. We are fortunate to be living in freedom and without constant fear. I came to America to escape the constant fear and evil that the Bolsheviks cast on Russia. They killed our people, our priests our, and bishops, and tried to destroy our churches. Tetushka suddenly looked very tired and suggested they all meet again the following week to finish the story. It's hard to wait, Clara said. On the other hand, I don't want the story to end. Me neither, Annie agreed. I'm going to miss this so much. Perhaps we can find another book to read after this, Tatushka suggested. Yeah, or maybe we can write a sequel to Zorka, Clara laughed. Maybe, Tatushka smiled. Clara and Annie couldn't stand the wait and dropped by Tetushka's two days later. Can we finish the story today? They pleaded. Please join me next week for the next installment of Dawn's Gentle Light by Rennie Reaver, published by Picard Press, on readings from Under the Grapevine on Ancient Faith Radio. You've been listening to Readings from Under the Grapevine with Dr. Chrissy Hart, author and licensed psychologist living in York, Pennsylvania with her husband and two children. This is a weekly presentation on Ancient Faith Radio, your listener-supported Orthodox Internet Radio Connection. faith for the modern world. This is Ancient Faith Radio. He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48 verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits podcast. I am Father Andrew Stephen Damick, and if you're listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO, which is 855-237-2346, and we, were, we are going to get to your calls in 
roughly the second half of today's show. So this is our very, very first episode. So today we're going to be discussing angels and demons as a way to introduce the program to you and lay some foundations and let you know what it's all about. So some of you are probably familiar with the work that I've done with Ancient Faith Radio. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with my co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung's podcast and blog, which are both titled The Whole Council of God. But especially for those of you who are totally new, I thought we'd begin by each telling a little bit about ourselves and especially why we're doing this new show. So, Father Stephen, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell them what, what you hope to accomplish with this program? Sure. Um, my name, as you said, is Father Stephen DeYoung, uh, and uh, I'm the pastor at uh, Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, beyond that, my origins are mostly shrouded in mystery. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, the main thing I want to do here is disambiguate the two of us. Right. Uh, <laughs> Father Andrew Stephen Damick is one human person. <laughs> and Father Stephen D. Young is a different human person. Uh, although my first name is his middle name, and we both have a last name starting with a capital D, we are right. different humans. All right. So you're saying your middle um, name is not Duh? No. <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Duh Young? <laughs> no. It's actually no. James. But oh, I don't right. use it because apparently that confuses people, as you yes. discovered. As um, I've discovered. <laughs> so, and... Um, in terms of in terms of what we're here to accomplish um if anyone knows anything about me you know i'm a uh, bible guy and i do bible stuff uh, and i think what i really want to do is do a little part of the work of helping english-speaking american orthodox christians kind of appropriate more of the fullness of the orthodox faith particularly as it pertains to our spiritual sensibility, our sense of the spiritual world, and uh, the way that can and should infuse our whole lives. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as I said earlier, I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick, and I work full-time for Ancient Faith Ministries as their chief content officer, uh, a position that I started just five, six weeks ago, actually. Uh, I did serve in parish ministry for 13 years, including 11 as a pastor. And one of the kind of fun things that Father Stephen and I share is that we actually have both had the same job, although I had it for just two years and he had it for eight. But we are both the former assistant pastor of St. George Orthodox Cathedral in Charleston, West Virginia. So hello to any of you Charleston people out there who are currently listening to two of your former assistant pastors. Uh, but... Um, I, I, I'm super interested in this show because um, uh, I think that there's so much about spiritual life that it's easy for us not just to miss, but to have kind of endless struggles with that we don't necessarily have to have, right? And we're going to talk about this um, a lot as we go. And of course, not just in this episode, but it's going to be perennial issue. You know, the sense that we have that that uh, the 3D world that we experience is kind of all we feel like we can access most of the time, right? But, but, the, but as Christians, we want to access something beyond this. And it's very frustrating when you maybe reach out for God or the saints and you're like, well, where, where are you? You know, what, what's going on, right? And, you know, serving as a pastor for 11 years, uh, this is a perennial issue. And I think, you know, any pastors that are out you've had the same experience but even just christians you know that 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 we we all have this difficulty because we're modern people living in uh, a, a way of thinking and looking at the world that makes it difficult to access spiritual reality and so my interest is is pastoral um i mean i'm it's also just like i i like to geek out about this kind of stuff but i think one of the important kind of disambiguations to use your term father Stephen, to make here at the beginning is that uh uh you know just to define the one of the differences between the two of us is that that you are an actual biblical scholar right and maybe, maybe make you list off the, the languages that you read at some point uh <laughs> but uh and and i'm not so i'm not like it's not like 
you know, and now we have a panel of two experts in biblical scholarship ready to answer your question. That's not what this show is, right? So if you, you know, if you've read Father Stephen's blog, The Whole Counsel of God, you listen to his podcast, you know that he's studied this stuff very, very closely and has a lot of really in-depth knowledge. He actually has a doctorate. Is it biblical studies or New Testament? I'm trying to remember which... Biblical studies. Biblical studies, okay. This is my yeah, PhD. He actually, yeah. yeah, he actually has a PhD in this stuff. I super don't, right? But, um, you know, when we were first talking about this show, I said, I said to Father Stephen, I said, so, like, how are we going to make sure that this show isn't just you telling about the things you know and me sitting there saying, that's awesome, dude, you're awesome. And uh, your response was something like, well, you're way more practical than I am. Right. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my original pitch was that that you would read newspaper headlines and then I would explain how that relates to end times prophecy. <laughs> but you nixed that. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you are more practical and uh, also much more of a professional broadcaster. So uh, without you, this would just be the semi unending ramblings of a crazed nerd. Right, um, right. So, right. yeah. But I, I, I'll also say, so I think one of the things that you're going to hear as we go on this show uh, is I, I want to be learning, right? I've learned a lot from my friendship with Father Stephen, um, and I'm trying to learn, uh, you know, from a lot of other sources as well. I mean, Father Stephen sends me stuff all the time, and it's great, um, you know, and and and. Part of that is what we want to accomplish with this is that that we're going to be in a learning process together and that being an Orthodox Christian isn't about mastering a specific set of data and now you've got it down and you're catechized and you're good to go. You know, when you get to the gates of heaven, they're going to check and make sure that you can answer all the catechetical questions like that's not the way that being a Christian actually works. And, um, you know, in the past few years, a, a lot of things have really kind of opened my eyes to whole parts of Orthodox tradition that are there and are often are staring us in the face, but that uh, we're often not paying attention to. And I'll, I'll just give one example, okay? So you're probably going to hear us talk a lot about what we're going to call spiritual geography, right? So where is paradise? Where is the underworld? Uh, you know, the mountain of God, Hades, like all this kind of stuff, okay? And one of the things that, one of the teachings that's actually preserved in the Orthodox Church and has been handed down for many, many, many centuries, but that I, I've been an Orthodox Christian for over 20 years now, that I never actually paid attention to. So if you had come up to me and said, does the church teach this? I would be like, uh, I've never heard that. And, and one of those things is this teaching that St. John the Forerunner, John the Baptist, went to Hades to preach the coming of Christ. Now, you're not going to see that in the Bible, but it is a belief that is actually in Orthodox tradition. And so I actually noticed this for the first time just a few years ago. And the funny thing is, is it, it's actually kind of staring you in the face. Um, it's referenced in lots of places, especially in our liturgical tradition. So, so for instance, a couple weeks ago on the new calendar, we just celebrated the beheading of John the Baptist, that feast. And I had noticed that in the Apolitikian, which is kind of one of the main hymns for the feast, that it actually mentions that he goes to Hades to preach there. And I, I, I'd sung it for years, but I had never just taken notice of that particular phrase. It's in the Apolitikian, and so I started looking at other texts. And you know what? It's in the Kentuckian too, the other main hymn for the day. And then I started looking at more and more, especially throughout the Menaean, which is the main set of festal texts for the feast. And it's everywhere. It's mentioned over and over that he goes to the underworld to preach to those in Hades. And so I, that's just one example of something that's right there in our tradition and kind of staring you in the face. But unless you're oriented towards paying attention to it, you you're probably just going to kind of skip over it, not really even know that it's there. And so if I had to, if someone were to say to me, you know, if you could say in a nutshell, what is this show about? It's about talking, especially about those things that are right there in, in the Bible, right there in the church services, right there in the church fathers, but that maybe we've never noticed or we didn't know what to do with it. So we just kind of skipped over it or maybe it was hidden behind a translation issue and we just didn't know because we don't read the original languages. Uh, and sometimes these are really kind of important issues, 
right? It's not just obscure little things like, oh, that's neat. You know, it's, it's, it's really important issues for your spiritual life. So I don't know. That's a much longer way of saying what my motivation is for doing this show. But I think it's important for us to lay this stuff out at the beginning so that people get the idea. You know, this is not a, a couple of professors teaching a class in demonology or angelology or any of that kind of stuff. Like, that's not what's going on. Uh, but obviously, we're going to be touching on a lot of those kinds of, of topics, right? So is there anything else that, Father, you wanted to add in terms of, you know, laying out what it is we're trying to accomplish with this particular show? Well, just going along with what you were just saying, that, um, and one of the questions that uh, we will probably end up getting asked relatively frequently is sort of why people haven't heard this stuff before. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, I get that at least when I go dredging up some Ugaritic legend or something and saying, oh, see, this explains this icon, you know. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, Ugaritic, so, wait, is, what? Is, Ugaritic <laughs> is one of, one of the obscure languages that Father Steve knows how to read. <laughs> it's, it's super helpful if we ever get a time machine and I can go back to like 1500 BC. Um, <laughs> but, you know... Uh, and it's important to recognize that the, the one of the things, as you just mentioned, once so, you read something or someone tips you off to these things, and you start seeing them in iconography, you start hearing them in the hymns of the church, like they're everywhere. It's just we haven't been taught to sort of think in that way and think in that direction. So our Orthodox tradition has sort of preserved all of these data points, has preserved all of this information and all of this context. Uh, for us, it's just we haven't necessarily, as English-speaking Orthodox Christians in the West, sort of fully appropriated how to connect those dots and how it all fits together and what the connective tissue is between these yeah. different things, between yeah. this biblical passage and this icon and this hymn. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as, as people living in the West, we tend to value education a great deal. And so this is one of the places where a... Uh, you know, a godly education, right? A, a, an appropriately spiritually formed education can really be helpful to us, right? So we're not talking about academia in all the negative ways that people tend to to use that term, right? You know, we're not. It's not about ripping apart the tradition or destroying what people believe or anything like that, but actually using all kinds of great tools of study that show us, as you said, the connective tissue between things that are right there in our tradition. So the question is not, you know, should this be in our tradition, but why is it there and how does it connect with all this other stuff? You know, so I, I think people are going to be delighted and really excited and interested in a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. And um, in many ways, you're never going to be able to see the Bible in the same way again. Like, I remember the time you told me that the book of Joshua was about giants. I was like, wait, wait what? 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 <laughs> about giants? You know, and I was just, I was just really excited to hear that, you know, um, and, and that's one of the books that a lot of people never want, don't want to read because they feel like it's a book about genocide, you know, uh, and we're, we're not going to talk, you know, this is not the Giants episode, but there is going to be a Giants episode. Um, so, so yeah, Giants and, and Dragons and, you know, all these things are, are in the scripture and in our tradition. And so the, the question is what? What do we do with that and how do we understand what it what it means and, and then you know how do we best um live in that reality right you know you don't want to open up boxes that you shouldn't open but <laughs> there's also just a reality of spirit a spiritual reality that's that's there so anyway so i you know we want to start our discussion today um as i said this is a, this is a, a an episode about laying the foundations for the rest of what this show is going to be and we're going to by the way we're going to be on uh, twice a month. So the second and fourth Thursdays of the month, it's not exactly fortnightly because occasionally there's going to be five Thursdays in a month, right? So, but it's going to be the second and fourth Thursdays of the month. Um, and, and, you know, that's when you're going to be able to tune in live and it will be available as a podcast for those of you who can't tune in live for whatever reason, you know, your you know, time zone that's halfway across the world or you have something going on, right? But we wanted, I wanted to start with this discussion of the question of materialism. OK, and I think in Christian circles, we tend to use the word materialism as a kind of synonym for greed. Right. You know, that person's very materialistic. They want to buy a lot of stuff. 
they're obsessed with their stuff. But that's not what we mean by materialism and in, in what we're talking about. So, so if you had to give a nutshell definition of materialism, Father, what would you say? Uh, it's basically the belief that uh, matter and energy and their, their co-relationships and interactions are all that exists. Right, so there's no demons out there. No fairies. Right. There's no demons, no God, no, no, God. Uh, no miracles. Just you don't have a soul. Mathematics and science can explain everything. Uh, right. And yeah. yeah. So it's just atoms bouncing off each other, and that's all there is. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's sort of the ultimate, in some ways, it's kind of the ultimate deterministic universe. Um, where everything that you think and feel and do and say was actually determined from the moment of, say, a Big Bang, which got all the atoms b bouncing off of each other, and now they've bounced and they made you for this one little blip in time. And if that sounds ultimately kind of meaningless, that's because it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we don't, we don't believe that. We're not materialists. We believe that there's an immaterial character to reality. Um, but here's the thing, right? Modern Christians, I think, are materialists. And here's why I would say that. It's not because most Christians don't believe that there's an immaterial element of reality, that they don't believe they have a soul, that they don't believe there's angels, that they don't believe that God is real, right? Christians will say, I mean, I've never met a Christian that, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't believe in an immaterial reality. Maybe they're out there. I don't know. It doesn't look like Christianity to me. But, uh, but I would say that modern Christians are materialists, not on purpose, but by habit, right? That, that on a day-to-day -day basis, the way we mostly live our lives is uh, as though the 3D world of the senses is all that there is. Right. The example I often give is, you know, one time I ate a lot of um, pizza and some spicy hot wings. And, you know, I'm getting to be middle aged. In fact, Father Stephen and I are almost the same age. He is a little older uh, by just a few months, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. you, you know, you know, get middle aged, you eat hot wings and pizza and stuff. And, and your, your innards are going to let you know later in the day, maybe immediately, that that was not the best thing to do. Right. So what do we do when we have, you know, acid indigestion? You take antacids, chew up those those little those little pills. I like the mint flavored ones and um, you feel better. And that's all there is to it. You had a problem. So you took a medicine and boom, you're better. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But like what point along that that continuum of experience and response did I include anything <laughs> having to do with God or the saints. I mean, if, if, if the idea of having acid indigestion sounds like it's too trivial to involve God in, then that means that you are a materialist by habit, right? And, and, and I am, right? I think, I think everybody listening to this probably is. Now, it's possible that there's some, some, some very spiritual people listening to this who aren't. And, you know, if you are, please pray for us, right? But, but I think most of us are materialists by habit, you know, the other example I give is like if someone, you know, I, I experience this as many times as, as a pastor. Someone gets sick, they go to the hospital. After they're at the hospital, they call the priest. It's interesting, the order, right? First, let's go get the medicine. And then after that, we, we get, we'll add some prayer, right? There's nothing wrong with the medicine. There's nothing wrong with going to the hospital. There's nothing wrong with the doctor. I mean, those are all things God provides. But we tend to think of prayer as kind of a frosting on the cake, you know, or like, well, make sure you pray. You know, that's the way that we function. We're sort of materialists by habit, by habit. And so this presents a problem to us, especially when we're actually then experience something in life where we realize that our material habits actually don't address our problem, that don't address my, you know, and it's not just the problems of like everyday aches and pains or, or you know, th things to solve in your life, but, but the problem of being a sinful person in this world and trying to be faithful to Christ. That's the problem, right? And, and if you're a materialist by habit, then that makes that problem a lot harder. A lot harder because you feel like you don't really have access to God very much. You're like, oh yeah, I pray all the time. And some people say, oh, I feel that God is with me. But like, do you know? I mean, do you have a sense he's actually there, right? 
and and one of the things you probably notice if you read the Bible enough, or if you read other kinds of ancient sources, is that a lot of people in those texts are not like that. They have a sense that God is with them, and that spirits are there, right? Um, so so there is a difference between us and them, and I think it's mainly a difference of habit, right? And we're going to get into that as to what what can you do about that. But, but yeah. that's one of the things that we want to try to address with this show is, is how to, and this is where kind of the more the, some of the practical side of this comes in. It's like how to, to uh, alter your habits so that you are more human, actually, and more in tune with all of reality and not just the 3D world of the senses, right? So, I mean, you have anything you wanted to add to that, Father? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think the way it pragmatically works out for most Christians in, in America and in the West is, I mean, you have essentially two incompatible ideas. You have basically an atheist worldview and a Christian worldview that you're kind of switching back and forth between. Right. Atheist most of the time. And, Christian yeah. Life. And yeah. And, and that works, you know, the analogy I use, I guess it's an analogy, is that, that we sort of have this set of brackets. Yeah. where we sort of bracket off certain things, right? So, like, the miraculous stuff that happened in the scriptures, okay, well, I've I got to believe that that's real, and I believe in God. So we put the brackets around God and the, and the miracles in scripture. And then, depending on what sort of Christian group you're in, those brackets may be very wide or very narrow. Uh, but they're always, they're always sort of there. There's always a point where you go outside those brackets and where we start becoming sort of naturalists again. So if someone, you know, if a Buddhist comes to you and claims there was a miracle, the first thought of most American Christians is not, well, this is demonic activity. The first thought of most American Christians is bull, right? You're yeah, making that up. Right. That never right. happened. <laughs> right. right. Or your or your or your, you know, your your elderly aunt comes to you and says, you know, you know, your, your, your grandmother talked to me last night, you know, your dead grandma, you know, she came to me You're like, um, is that, well, I'm going to, you know, that's nice. Right. Like we, we tend to function that way. We don't give credence to it. Now, the problem is, I think that we have this fear that if you start to give credence to it, then you become gullible. Right. Oh, right. Just Which we don't want to be. Right. You don't want to, yeah, we want to be superstitious. That's not the same. Like, we're not teaching people how to be superstitious as well. <laughs> That's right. not what right. we're doing, you know. But, but atheists will make hay of that with right. us. Right. 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 They say, hey, I'm just saying the same thing about your miracles that you say about everybody else's. Right. I'm just saying the same thing about your God that you say about everybody else's. Yeah, I just believe in one fewer God right. than you do. <laughs> right. And yeah, so, I mean, I've, I've heard that a bunch of times. Yeah, and, and it's... And they kind of have a point in that all too often we are basically looking at most of the world the same way they do. Right. And then right. being inconsistent in these areas, you know, that we've got bracketed off. Right. And, and you, can't, you can't just like flip a switch and decide, okay, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be a materialist anymore. <laughs> Today, right. I will believe in spirits. Right. You know, like we, you well, can't just... This, I'm going to be I'm going to court a low grade controversy by saying um, the rubber met the road with this recently with a lot of people, even in, in our orthodox circles, where when the pandemic started and people were saying, OK, we need to take reasonable precautions. We need to be in obedience to our bishops and the civil government, but we also need prayer, incense, you know, in orthodox countries, people are going out with holy water in the streets. Right. And a lot of our of our Christian brothers and sisters in the United States were like, OK, guys, this is serious. This is a disease. This is real. Right. In response, it, it, you know, like, yeah, all that stuff's fun on Sunday morning. But this is a serious situation. People are dying. Yeah. 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 You don't don't call a priest for this. We need. Yeah. Epidemiologists. You right. know? And and it's and it's not that we're saying uh, your your local Orthodox preach, priest is a witch doctor and don't take medicine, right? <laughs> that's that's right. the other opposite extreme. Uh, that that uh, the world is composed of both the physical world that's described by science and the spiritual world uh, that we come to experience uh, through Christ. Uh, 
Yeah. And those two have to be kept together. And the problem is we're at one extreme. The answer is not to go to the opposite extreme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons that why in like the description for the show, I wanted to especially use that phrase, the union of the seen and the unseen. Right. I, I you know, we're not just talking about like this is not a show about ghosts. <laughs> right. It's not it's not like, you know, here's how you deal with your haunted house. Although I'm sure I hope we do get at least one caller that calls in and says that their house is haunted and what do you do about that because there is something to do actually uh, yes and but, i have done it yeah, i've right. done an exorcist i've done an exorcism on a house to tease everyone yeah there you um, go all right everybody yeah so 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 that's the problem you know that's the problem of materialism right and uh, so in you know in a few minutes we're going to go for our, our first break but before we get to that um l let's just talk for just a a very few minutes about the title of this podcast, which we taught you and I talked about this. We went back and forth for weeks to try to figure out exactly the right, the right thing. Um, and I'm not going to, I, unfortunately I've forgotten most of the bad uh, suggestions that we had, but we finally settled on Lord of spirits, Lord of spirits, which, which one person with, with, with ancient faith radio kept calling Lord of the spirits. And I was like, Oh, maybe we'll get a few Lord of the Rings fans. I, that wouldn't make me unhappy at all, but no, it's Lord of <laughs> Lord of spirits. Although you could say Lord of the spirits that will, that works too. Lord of spirits. So it, it's not a phrase you see. I don't think it's in the Bible. Is it, is it in the Bible? Well, it depends on your Bible. Are you yeah, Ethiopian? Right. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So um, open that up for us a little bit. Where does this phrase "Lord of Spirits" come from, and and why did we pick it? So, uh, "Lord of Spirits" is one of several titles that's ascribed to God uh, in the Enochic literature, which is the various books of Enoch, as well as other books like the Apocalypse of Abraham, uh, and the Book of Jubilees, and a few other text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Lord of Spirits is mostly used in the second portion of First Enoch or the Book of Enoch, which is called the, uh, the Book of Parables. And the reason it's used there is that it's a title for God that describes his relationship with the other spiritual beings whom uh, he created. Uh, and so it's it's a way of referring to God in relationship to the heavenly host, the divine council, some of these other concepts that we're going to be talking about a lot, not only in this episode, but in a bunch of episodes. Um, and I'm sure in uh, people's people's questions, uh, the the parallel uh, title that you find more commonly in in the Hebrew Bible is uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, which is usually translated uh, Lord Sabaoth, uh, and uh, a lot of people in the liturgy we transliterate rather than translate uh, Sabaoth. Right. Uh, and so, because of the way it looks in English, the way it's spelled in English, people think it refers to the Sabbath. Sabbath, um, right? And when I say people, I have a recording of Bart Ehrman saying that. Oh boy! So his Hebrew isn't <laughs> really? really up to snuff. Yes. Yikes! Um, I mean, I don't read Hebrew, but I I know that that's not the same yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Sabaot is uh, the O ending is a feminine plural ending in uh, Hebrew. Tzava, uh means to be many, to team, okay. to be many, and so that in a nominal form in the plural means like big groups or hosts. Lord of hosts is how Host. uh, the um, King James Old Testament. Right. Yeah, and so we that. you know we, we sing right in the anaphora of the divine liturgy, we sing, you know, what in Latin is called the Sanctus, right? Holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Right? So this is one of those things like so so we're talking about it here now. This is one of those things that's right there, core piece of our liturgical tradition. I mean, it is right there at the heart of the divine liturgy. We call God the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of Hosts, right? And so, it's it, it's there, and, and you, uh, it doesn't just mean that He's got a lot of angels available to Him. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about all of that, but 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 you know, He is Lord of Hosts, and it's interesting. And then and it also comes in. If you've ever gone to Great Compline, which we especially serve during, at least in our tradition, during Great Lent, 
uh, but it shows up, of course, at other times of the liturgical year. There is a um, there is a hymn in there called Lord of Hosts. Uh, o Lord of Hosts, be with us, for we have no other help but uh, in times of sorrow but Thee. Right, which is in 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 the Byzantine tradition is just a wonderful, big throaty kind of manly hymn. Uh, and and uh, but what's interesting is that in Greek it's Kyrie Dynameion, Lord of Powers. But it means the same thing, right? I mean, that's just simply the, isn't that just the, the Septuagint translation of, you know, Lord Sabaoth, right? Yeah, it, it gets complicated because uh, yeah. the, the Septuagint does it different ways. But yeah, it's, it's the same kind of idea, God of the powers. The, the hymn, the, the, the Trisagion, the, the uh, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord Sabaoth is, is being sung by the angels. And it's a way of the angels expressing and worshiping him as their God. Right. Uh, that's the way we don't always think about it. And that's why there's a similar phrase also in uh, our memorial prayers, uh, which is actually taken directly from the Book of Jubilees, a different piece of Anakic literature, uh, that where uh, the prayer begins, O God of spirits and of all flesh. Right. Another piece that probably just rattles by most of us. Like I prayed it for years as a priest, O God of spirits and of all flesh, you know, but I never paused and thought, wait, wait, who are the spirits? That we're saying he's the god of exactly well this is what we're talking about right that's that's what this is so all right well uh we're gonna take a break now and but when we come back from the break we're gonna start talking about the many different ways that the word gods is used in the bible so uh you know we want you to call in we're gonna take calls in the second half of the show you can call at uh, 855-AF-RADIO, that is 855-237-2346. And I have to admit, I'm always uh, tempted to say 855-AF-RADIO, but then I think people might put the, the letter I in there somewhere where it shouldn't be. But anyways, all right, well, let's take a break, and we will be right back in just a few minutes. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the second half of The Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Hi, this is Father Evan Armitas, priest at St. Spirit on Greek Orthodox Church in Loveland, Colorado, and the host of the Ancient Faith Radio Sunday night call-in show, Orthodoxy Live. I am pleased to announce today the release of my first book for Ancient Faith Publishing, titled Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, A Practical Guide to Prayer, Fasting, and Almsgiving. It seeks to provide a guide to the three basic and primary disciplines of Orthodox spirituality. Through these disciplines, Christ opened for us a path that frees us from the disordered way of life that has become normal for many, even though their hearts and minds tell them otherwise. Please join me in exploring the three-legged stool of Orthodox spiritual practice, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, Books now available at store.ancientfaith.com. And the title, once again, is Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. I look forward to sharing it with you. God bless. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855 855- AF Radio. All right. Well, we are back. And before we get to our discussion about the way the word gods is used in the Bible, I just wanted to thank uh, the man whose voice you just heard. And that is uh, our good friend, Stephen Cristoforo, uh, who's provided the voiceover work for this this podcast. I think he he just nailed it. <laughs> so if you know Steve, tell him that he did a fine job. Thank you, Steve. I hope hope that you're listening. So I, yeah, let's so let's talk about the word gods as it's used in the Bible, because that I think is going to be the one of the ways that people are going to hear stuff that we're going to say on this show. And it's going to sound weird to them. And they're going to wonder if we're actually Christians because <laughs> we're saying, <laughs> well, I, I believe in lots of gods, actually, uh, you know, but but uh, so let's let's talk about why as a Christian you can and should believe in many gods uh, if that doesn't weird you out too much. So let's let's begin by talking about how the word gods is actually used in the Bible. And this is one of the ways 
that sometimes translation is hiding something from us, right? So we, we have an English translation that might use other kinds of words, uh, but lurking underneath is a Hebrew word or a Greek word that actually is saying gods. And that's, but it doesn't get translated as gods in, in English. So, so what, are, what are some examples of that, Father? Yeah, um, before we freak everybody out, let me give one more proviso in terms of why we're freaking everybody out. Yeah, right. Uh, one might wonder why you would do this to people. Um, <laughs> the, the, the reality is that, that uh, there are certain things that are just in the scriptures. Uh, whether we, as sort of modern Christians with a materialist bent, kind of are comfortable with that or not. And uh, they have a way of speaking. And from the Victorian era through until probably the 1950s or so in, the, in America, there was sort of a gentleman's agreement that we would all sort of paper over these things in our English translations and Thanks, not, guys. Push on them too, <laughs> not push on them too hard um, and so that we could all be comfortable. Uh, and... The, the problem is that uh, if we want to continue to do that as Orthodox Christians, we're setting ourselves up for a problem with future generations. Because yeah. while I may not want to get into, say, a passage in the Old Testament that talks about human sacrifice, uh, the atheist roommate of my son or daughter, the atheist professor of my son or daughter is going to have no such qualms about right. bringing up all of these things. Yes. Uncomfortable and, stuff in the Bible. And when that happens, if we have tried to paper over it and not talked about it and not explained it uh, to our people, not only are they going to fall for whatever narrative they're told, but we're not going to have any credibility to come back with a response because yeah. we've already proven that we're trying to keep things from them. Yeah. We're uh, embarrassed by our own central text. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's why we're going to talk about these kind of things. Uh, it's not because we're trying to shake anybody up or be firebrands or cause controversy or, no. you know. No, I mean, you yeah. and I, I mean, you and I are both dedicated to being solid normal mainstream orthodox christians right you know that hopefully yeah. the only thing extreme about us is our repentance and i'm i'm just learning that <laughs> you know uh you know you're, these are not like this is not about pitching crackpot theories folks it's not it's about looking very closely at our bible at our church fathers at our church services and saying what do they really say and what are they taking seriously that maybe we're not Right. So, you know, one of, one of the examples and, and, you know, Father Stephen has very helpfully provided a lot of the research for this. Um, uh, one of the examples that we have in our notes that I thought is a great place to start and it's kind of a shocking passage just if you just simply read it and actually pay a little bit of attention to it is uh, from the very beginning of Psalm 82. So, you know, get out your Bibles, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Psalm 82, if you're looking at uh, like a King James Bible or another Bible that's using the Hebrew numbering of the Psalms, but it's Psalm 81, if you're looking at the Greek Septuagint numbering. And I just wanted to read the first couple, the first, really the first verse, actually. And um, just to show that what we're talking about is not something that we're making up, right? So here's Psalm 81 or 82, depending on which version you're reading, verse 1. And I'm reading it out of the Orthodox Study Bible. God stood in the assembly of gods. He judges in the midst of gods, saying, and then it goes on to say what he says. God stands in the assembly of gods. Like it doesn't say God stood in the assembly of so-called gods, right? It doesn't say, it just simply says God stood in the assembly of gods. And if you read, you keep reading the Psalm, it never says anywhere in it, those beings that he's standing in the midst of are not gods. Right. So so what's going what's going on there? Like, what's what's the deal? I thought we believed in only one God. So do, do you want some more examples first or do you want to? Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. One? Let's yeah, let's roll on with some more. <laughs> let's yeah, let's just let's, leave that question. Let's hanging. pile them up. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's pile. Yeah, right. Because it's everywhere. Right. OK. Give, yeah. Yeah. Give us another one, Father Steve. Right. So uh, Psalm 89, uh, okay. 88 in the uh, Greek numbering. And right. uh beginning around verse 5, 
let the heavens praise your wonders, O Yahweh, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the sons of God is like Yahweh? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. Uh, so this is talking about the relationship between God and heavenly sons of God. Uh, right. It says who in the skies, so that's kind of hard to make be, you know, humans of any It's not kind. about people, right? <laughs> right. You can't just read this um, as being about sort of theoses because it's in the it, heavens. Yeah. And uh, I'll just I'll just keep rolling. <laughs> yes. And I, let me just actually, say, actually, yeah. I, I just noticed the very next verse right after what you read, verse nine. I'm looking at the Orthodox Study Bible. Oh, Lord, God of hosts, who is like you? <laughs> right. So the next line is describing this relationship that we're that we're we're discussing. OK, go on. Yeah. What's, what's the next? And, and, well, and it, to even add to that, it goes on in verse 10 to talk about uh God crushing a sea monster and and throwing its carcass uh, to the earth. Yeah, um, we we have to do a whole episode on <laughs> monsters, yeah. you know, or on specific monsters. Like we could do one on Leviathan, one on Behemoth. And behemoth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but so then Exodus fifteen eleven. You know who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Um, this isn't comparing God, the God of Israel, to imaginary characters, right? That that wouldn't be a big praise. Like, who in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is like God? <laughs> right. right? Like, yeah. I mean, right. okay, but what do you, what does that prove, right? <laughs> right. Um, Exodus 18:11, three chapters later. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all gods, because of this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. The they is the gods. The Egyptian gods in this case, right? Right. Yeah. That, that, and imaginary characters can't deal arrogantly with people. Right. Right. And, uh, and where is, isn't it later in Exodus where, where God says that he's judged the gods of Egypt? It's earlier. Right? That's what he, earlier, that's, what, okay. that's what God says he's doing on Passover night. Right. He's is, judging he's the gods of Egypt. Judgment. Like, right. So yeah. like, is God rendering judgment to made up characters that the Egyptian pagans are worshiping. Like it doesn't, the text doesn't say that. It doesn't say they're fake. It doesn't say that they don't exist. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, we could, we will get into it in the new Testament later. I mean, most of the stuff we're reading from the old, but we're showing, you know, if, if you look at the, if you look at the scriptures folks closely, you'll see that the scriptures are taking these things very seriously and not, saying this is some kind of metaphor or again made up stories like one of the problems with the way that the modern world tends to look at um ancient religion is they'll say oh well they notice that there's lightning in the sky or they notice that there's earthquakes or they notice that the nile floods and so they came up with some kind of explanation for it and eventually that explanation evolved into believing in some kind of god of lightning or what no that's that's not the way that the bible depicts this stuff and it's not the way that the people on the ground understood what they were doing right that that's not that they they attest to the fact that they had encounters with these spiritual beings and the bible takes them very very seriously again god standing in the mucks of the gods god judging gods you know it's 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 lots of places okay i know we got some more okay let's let's talk yeah. about a couple more here <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah. we do uh, want to take some calls yeah deuteronomy ten seventeen. uh for yahweh your god is god of gods and lord of lords the great the mighty and the awesome god who is not partial and takes no bribe yeah, there it and, is. And uh, Psalm ninety-five three is similar. It's for for Yahweh is a great God and a great King above all gods. Uh, so when we see this language, God of gods, it's not just a superlative. It's saying that the other gods have have the God of Israel as their God. Right. I mean, you could say like you could read Lord of Lords and say, okay, that means that God is above all the kings and the presidents or whatever the earth. But but it, God of gods is harder to explain away. <laughs> right. And, and especially when it's disambiguated as the great king above all gods. Right. Right. That it's not that they don't exist. It's that he's he's their king. And so right. what what's going on here is a couple of things. The, the first is that uh, the word God is just being used to refer to spiritual beings. 
It's yeah, hard to reflect yeah, yeah. in English. We usually do that by using a capital letter for God and then Be God. a lowercase God or gods for these other beings. Um, right. But the, the reason for that, and, and the fathers actually, when they, when they talk about the word, the Greek word theos and, and what it means, they really get into the idea that it's, it's kind of a verbal idea, even though it's a noun. Okay, what do you that, mean by that? That, that the word is, is something that God does. He is God. It has to do with his, like, godding. <laughs> it's, uh, it has to do with his dominion and his rule uh, and his power. Huh. Uh, and some examples of this that might help with that in, in the New Testament. For example, St. Paul refers to uh, the devil as the god of this present age. Right. right. He's not saying that he rivals the God of Israel in power right? or prestige or is a second God. He's talking about the function he has. And, or certainly he's not saying that he should be worshiped. Right. And we're going to talk, I know over and over and over about that issue. (laughs) Yeah. But St. Paul is saying that he is worshiped in this present age. Right. Yeah. That, and so, uh, these, these spiritual beings can be called gods in English. We do it with a small G, but, you know, they aren't using capitals in in Greek, uh, can be talked about that way because um, either on the one side, God has chosen to share his rule and his dominion with them. And so with, with angelic beings, they are sharing in and reigning with God and God is exercising his rule and his dominion and his power and his authority through them, graciously sharing it with them. or on the other side, on the more demonic side, because humans in their rebellion and sin have elevated these spiritual beings and wor- chosen to worship and serve them and become enslaved to them. Yeah. Uh, and so they are functioning as gods in that sense. They become uh, their and, god. And I know, yeah. I think it may be even our next show in a fortnight, we're going to go deeper into this, but this is a big part of what's going on when... Uh, the fathers talk about theosis and talk about us becoming gods. Uh, that's directly connected to the idea in the New Testament of, of Christ exercising his rule and authority through the saints in glory, hmm. uh, that they rule and reign with him and share in his, uh, in his dominion. But we'll get more yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just wanted to make a, another because we're going to be talking. I know because because we're both nerds uh, in, in in different ways and on different levels for sure. Uh, but we're going to be talking a lot about words and what they mean uh, and how they're used and how they're used in lots of different ways. And someone might counter and say, "Well, it doesn't the word Elohim, which you know, doesn't that mean God's in in Hebrew? Doesn't Elohim just mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Doesn't that just mean Yahweh? Right?" Um, is, is that the case? Is Elohim only used in the in the Hebrew Bible for Yahweh? No. In fact, it's even more flexible than Theos. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Right. <laughs> right. Elo- Elohim is used to refer uh, to any spiritual being. So it's used okay. to refer to God, the true God. It's used to refer to the gods, uh, the same word, Elohim. Uh, and now to really freak people out, oh, yeah. uh, I have a, a, a couple of examples uh, where it's even used uh, for deceased uh, humans. Um, the first one, and the one that might freak people out less, uh, is um, in First Samuel 28, verse 13. Right, when, and this is uh, First Kingdoms, if you're looking at a Septuagint yeah. Bible. If you're in your... If you're in your uh, Orthodox study Bible. Right. Uh, This is when uh, Saul, near the end of his reign as king, uh, and his disobedience uh, goes to consult with the witch or the medium at Endor, um, not the one with the Ewoks. Uh, Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The city uh, in Palestine. Uh, And asks her to summon up the spirit of Samuel. And there's this moment in verse 13 where she's kind of seemingly maybe a little surprised at how well it worked. Um, And uh, because she starts freaking out 
And uh, verse 13 says, The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. Yeah. So, and then that turns out to be Samuel's spirit and he speaks. Right. So he's um, called a God in the Bible. Right. So he's, he, the term Elohim is used to apply to him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the biblical author is not saying that, that the prophet Samuel was another person of the Trinity or that he was a polytheist and right. the prophet Samuel now lived on Mount Olympus um, right. or something. Uh, that's, yeah. um, that's, not, that's not what he's going for. The word is just flexible to include that. Now, yeah. And now the one that will be most controversial uh, that I kind of warned you about, but we're going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is in uh, Exodus 21. Uh, verses 1 through 6, which is in the context of laws governing slavery. Uh, so not controversial at all, this passage, uh, in uh, the Torah. And uh, so this particular rule uh, that's being made in the, in the first six verses of Exodus is for a situation where uh, someone has been in a period of indentured servitude. So they've been working for and part of a household for some period of time to pay off a debt. And they come to the end of their term of service, but they, they like the household and the family and they want to stay on. Um, there were strict rules about how long you could keep someone in slavery and all of these things that are outlined in the rest of the chapter. But so if a person voluntarily says, you know, I rather like being the tutor or nanny for your children and I want to stay, you know, I feel like I'm part of the family. There was a provision to do that. And so there is a ritual described here for what you do uh, with that person who has decided they want to stay permanently as part of the household. And so uh, I'll read uh, Exodus 21 verses 5 and 6. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the gods and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Uh, there's not a way to get around the fact that it says that he will bring him to the gods. Yeah. In the Hebrew, there's a definite article. Mm -hmm. So the, the word the. So yeah. you can't say bring him to God. Yeah. Yeah. It's the gods. And uh, St. Jerome translated this just woodenly literally. It's If you look in, in uh, the Vulgate, he has uh, deus. It's just the plural of God. Bring him to the gods. Yeah. <laughs> he just wow. translated it directly from, yeah. the, from the Hebrew. Uh, the the, the uh, Greek is interesting uh, because the Greek says uh, that you should uh, bring him before the court of God. Right, yeah, like the Orthodox Study Bible has the judgment seat of God. Right, and it's right. not the word judgment seat. It's the, it's the word, it's uh, uh, where we get the word criterion, actually. It's criterion. Yeah. Um, the, the and it means of, a law court. It means like the actual oh, wow. court. Yeah, so there's like the other people McCain. there. Right. Yeah, so it's yeah, talking yeah. about like the council of God, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and and our, the people in right. the council. Well, well, so okay, so um, I want to I want to move on here so we can start taking a couple calls because okay. uh, Bobby is telling me that we have a lot of people who have called in. So thanks, okay. everybody. Let, let, uh, let yeah, me add, yeah. Let me let me add one one little note before we do that. I don't want to leave people yep. hanging with yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. There. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, who that's yeah, yeah, referring sure. to. Um, that uh, who that's referring to are the departed family members. Oh yeah, right, right. They're because they're still the around. Of your home, in some sense. Right. God is yeah. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yeah. And so yeah. the idea here is that it's not that you like summon up the spirits of your dead ancestors or worship them or sacrifice them. There's none of that here. Right. right? But you take them to the doorpost which is sort of representative of the household and the family. That's why that's what was marked with blood on the Passover. You take yeah. them there and you do this to do this ritual because you're making them a part of the family. 
And so it's talking about those ancestors as witnesses. It's more closely related to the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11 than to some kind of ancestor worship or something. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to get that in so people don't walk away <laughs> with, a, with a weird idea. Yeah. Um, so just to summarize uh, real quick then. So when we're talking about spirits or gods, setting aside those terms to use to refer to Yahweh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's kind of three kinds of beings that are described as gods in the Bible. And we're just talking about the Bible here. We're not even getting into some of the more interesting, I don't want to say more interesting, some of the literature you probably haven't read too much of folks, you know, like Enoch or Jubilees, whatever. And there's three kinds of beings. There's angels, there's demons, which really are just angels that are rebelling against God. And there's dead people, you know, those who have passed on. Uh, those are all referred to as gods in the scripture. So, yeah, so um, I want to start taking calls. But before we take the first call, actually, I wanted to answer a question that came in over email. And um, this comes from uh, Brian, who's actually uh, relatively local to me. And he sent me an email earlier today because he heard we were going to be talking about angels and demons and so forth. And he sent this question. He said, my grandson, John Cassian, what a great name for a kid, uh, who is six years old, is going to be listening to your podcast and angels tonight from Scottsdale, Arizona. He is very interested in angels right now, wants to ask if good angels are able to be killed by bad angels. He's curious about whether they can die or not. And I just want to take this one. And the reason here's why, because this might be the only question that I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> from the other ones. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. I may be about to um actually you, but okay, yeah, maybe, maybe that put it, that tension out there. Right, exactly. Because I mean, that's one of the things that's going to be going on. Is like I, I, I'm, 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 I'm ready to be corrected. I'm ready to learn. But I'm going to say that that good angels cannot be killed by bad angels because they don't have mortal bodies. Am, am I correct in that? Uh, we do have an episode we're going to be talking about uh, spiritual bodies in the future, but this is not it. Yeah. Without going into the whole bodies question, because yes, that's a big topic unto itself. Yes, um, right. Um, so it is true that that you are correct. Obviously, that that evil <laughs> angels cannot kill good angels, right? Right. However, hey. however, yeah, evil angels can die. Yeah, um, yeah. We just that's... read from Psalm eighty-two. Yes, uh, we yes. We didn't read the verse, but verses six and seven. I have said uh, you're I gods, said, but you shall die like men. Right. You will. There you is. will die like men. Yeah. And uh, so the the thing we have to keep in mind is that when when the fathers talk about death, they Saint John of Damascus clearly disambiguates this. There's there's physical death and there's spiritual death. And so physical death is something that happens to humans, where our soul is separated from our body. Yeah. Yeah. And so, as you said, angels don't have mortal bodies, so they can't so that die happen. physically in that sense. Right. There's right. also, however, spiritual death, which is the separation of the soul or spirit from God. Yeah. And yeah. that is the fate that awaits uh, the demonic spirits right. at the final judgment. Right. Is which, which if I'm correct, death. doesn't mean non-existence. Right. It's kind of an eternal dying or eternal death. Right, because death, yeah, yeah. death doesn't mean not existence for us yeah. either. Right, right, right. Okay. All right, well, we're going to go to break, and then as... Hey there, this is Bobby Maddox, Station Manager of Ancient Faith Radio, and it appears like we perhaps lost Father Andrew. Oh, I'm here. Oh, you are here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it just it got quiet, and um, and we did not know what was happening. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Can we go to break? Yeah, let's go to break. Let's go to break. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment <laughs> to take your calls on the second half of The Lord of Spirits. 
give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Now available on Ancient Faith Publishing, The Shield of Psalmic Prayer, Reflections on Translating, Interpreting, and Praying the Psalter. In this posthumous collection of poet and teacher Donald Sheehan's reflections on psalms and psalmic prayer, called from his journals and teaching notes, you will find two quite different kinds of writing working in tandem. Poetic and personal journaling by a man of faith, a scholar, a linguist, and in the deepest sense, a teacher. Alongside scholarly, linguistic, and poetic analysis by a man steeped in poetry who thought like a poet. Here's what Father Stephen Freeman has to say on the book. In the spiritual life, two things are essential, what we do and how we do it. And this wonderful collection of the late Donald Sheehan's thoughts on the Psalms, we see both. He takes us into what the Psalms are in depth, that is the Word of God, but he also demonstrates time and again how those depths shape his life in the world in which he lives. Thus we are given two things, the Word of God and a life in which the Word has given shape. It's a path we all should walk. You can find this book and others like it at store.ancientfaith.com. Again, that is store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. All right, we are back and we are now ready to take your calls. And uh, the first call that we want to take is from Aiden in Illinois, who has a question about the Divine Council. So, Aiden, are you there? Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to try to get to some of our other calls first then. Sorry about that, Aiden. Uh, we have, um, uh, is, is Daniel there who has a, a comment or a, a suspicion? That's what I'm reading in my notes here about the gods of Egypt. Daniel, are you there on the line? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm getting uh, voices on my ear. This is how you can tell it's live radio folks telling me that uh, some of these folks are way, way down in the queue. Um, actually, you know what? There's somebody who contacted me beforehand who I know had a really interesting question, and that is Stasia in uh, Georgia. So can we get Stasia on the line? Hi, Father. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's working. Wonderful. <laughs> Eureka. <Okay. laughs> so... Wonderful, delightful to be on the show. Glad to hear from you. Um, I have a question about First Corinthians 11. I've been covering my hair daily for most of the year. I probably started last November. I cover my hair about 90% of the time, and I don't really know why. Just I see it in icon. That's the only reason I have right now. But I'm looking at Scripture. I'm looking at First Corinthians 11.10. And my Catholic version here says, therefore, a woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head because of the angels. Because of the angels. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so this is one of these things that there is a very long explanation for this. But uh, I know that Father Stephen has covered this in some detail, so I'm going to punt this to him and say, give us the short version, Father Stephen, as to what it is. Why is it, does it say in 1 Corinthians 11.10 that a woman should have her head covered because of the angels? Yeah. Um, so this is good that we have a first question like this because I, I want to let people know um, some of, some of the questions that I've even seen in advance uh, from people who have emailed or, or uh, sent them in, in other ways are very good questions and very yeah. big questions. And yeah, so right. some of these are going to end up being an episode unto themselves at some point in the future yeah. um, because we want to do justice to it. But so when we get a question like this, this is an example of one of those really good questions. Um, I'll try to give you at least a sort of summary answer, and then we will probably come back to this at some point and expand more uh, in full. Um, 
and also because that will give me time to prepare this answer because, uh, though I won't go into it right now, the Greek in that passage is very sexually graphic. Um, and uh, right. it may not look that way in English. Uh, but um, what it is basically referring to is St. Is Paul, uh, one of the major problems he's addressing throughout his first epistle to the Corinthians is uh, helping the former pagan, now Christians, in the Christian community in Corinth to f sort of fully separate from their pagan way of life, including pagan modes of worship. Uh, which included a lot of sexual, ritual sexuality uh, in their worship. And so uh, St. Paul is, uh, in that overarching passage from which you read the verse, is uh, reiterating that, that there is no place for sort of sexual expression or sexual immorality within the worship of the Christian church. That seems obvious to us, but it wasn't obvious to a pagan in Corinth in the first century. Uh, and so the reason he specifically refers to angels there is that uh, for St. Paul and just about any other first century Jewish person, sort of the two paradigmatic sins were idolatry and sexual immorality. And so the worst thing you could do would be to mix those two things together. And the ultimate example of that in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament is actually what happens at the beginning of Genesis 6, in the first four verses of Genesis 6 that talks about the origin of the giants, that talks about some kind of sexual congress between uh, rebellious angelic beings and human beings um, and uh, it that was sort of ritual sexual immorality uh, that produced uh, that produced sort of these horrors on the earth uh, and so St. Paul is sort of alluding back to that and saying that uh, a woman needs to be not only not making a sexual display in the Christian church, but practicing sexual modesty, uh, not only because of the other humans there. You know, we sometimes hear about modesty in that sense. We don't want to tempt, you know, uh, the, the men in the congregation, and then that gets into all kinds of sexual politics and things. But St. Paul is even throwing it open to, you know, because sexual immorality in any kind of ritual sense, opens the door to all manner of sort of horrible evils. So that's what that's what St. Paul's alluding to there, um, is that idea. And so it, that modesty is important. It's important we go in the exact opposite direction of any kind of sexuality involved uh, in our worship. Our worship needs to be chaste and pure. Yeah. Uh, our worship of the true God. Yeah. And 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 you know we I know we're going to get into it at a, like in a future discussion, but at least. Part of why, if I remember correctly, part of why this is important in this case is that in that time and place, a woman displaying her glorious hair openly was regarded as essentially a thing to do to attract men, you know, and so, you know, doubly inappropriate for church. But, uh, you know, as to why that is considered attractive to men in that time and place. We're going to have to save, <laughs> save that for a future episode. It's going to blow your mind when you hear it though, folks. So, yeah. um, all right. So, uh, our, our next call comes from, um, from Gareth, uh, who is in Louisiana. So he's somewhere near you, father Stephen. Uh, and oh, he has, a he's very near me. <laughs> oh, oh, you, so you know him then. Uh, yes. so yeah, Gar Gareth, who's in Louisiana, he has a question about, about Mount Hermon. How's it Here? going, Noble? So can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, fantastic. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a little bit of context for uh, for my question. So Father Stephen has a uh, the blog post he did uh, a while back about Mount Tabor and Mount, and Mount Hermon. Um, this is the a common tradi traditional site for the Transfiguration of Christ. It's uh, it's called Mount Safan in the ba Baal cycle, and this is after Baal uh, defeats uh, Yam, who's the, the Canaanite god of the sea, he, uh, he ascends to become lord of Mount Safan or Mount Hermon. This is also in uh, in the Enochic literature, the the site of the 
Watchers and the Fallen Angels' descent upon uh, upon Earth. Uh, Second Enoch 19 says they broke their promise on the shoulder of Mount Hermon to defile themselves with human women. So um, this question is kind of, uh, I guess, refers to any sort of physical uh, geography and the, the correlation it has to heavenly events and places. But what is it about Mount Hermon that makes it a recurring physical place for events of such cosmic significance? So do you want me to go straight for that one? Yeah, right. Sure. So okay. yeah, Mount, Her- Mount. I mean, Mount Herman. You know, we've yes. been talking about the the. We're, we're going to talk about the divine council over and over and over and over and over again on this show. So what does Mount Herman have to do with all of that? Then, um, in in a, in a nutshell, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Again, this is another one that's going to be probably a future episode at some point. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, Mount Hermon uh, is not only a, a mountain, and of course, the, uh, throughout the ancient world, uh, gods live in gardens on top of mountains. It's, it's just a common place. Um, and so that imagery isn't just used in scripture for the Garden of Eden uh, or for Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, but it's used, obviously, the one most people would be familiar with would be Mount Olympus. Uh, but in the case of uh, Baal and uh, the divine council of El, that was Mount Zaphon. Zaphon is the, the word for, Semitic word for north. So it's the mountain of the north. Um, and that corresponds to Mount Hermon, which right now is, is kind of on the border of the Golan Heights. So it's not a place I would recommend visiting currently. Uh, but uh, in addition to being this mountain, uh, which was seen... Uh, by people from at least the late Neolithic period as being uh, a home of the gods. One of the things that furthered that is there's also a natural spring in a cave uh, at the base of uh, Mount Hermon. And uh, natural geographic features were the first shrines uh, for pagans. Uh, Mostly springs, groves of trees, trees that they could fence in. Those were sort of the first temples. Uh, And so uh, that cave uh, and that uh, spring were considered sacred to Baal, again, going back into the uh, likely the Neolithic period. It sort of got rebranded. Later, uh, it became a shrine to Pan, uh, the Greek god, and the name was changed to Panius. And then uh, today it's called Banius. It's gotten switched from a P sound to a B sound. Uh, and uh, if, if you were to go, which again I don't recommend at the present time, to Mount Hermon, uh, it is dotted with hundreds of uh, pagan shrines from all of those periods, going back to the, the Neolithic period all the way up through the Roman period, uh, all over its face, at its peak, altars. Uh, and the cave with the spring at the bottom was considered to be an entryway to the underworld. So yeah. any, any kind of, of thonic god, any kind of god associated with the underworld, which includes Baal, uh, that would be a place where people would go in order to interface with, with uh, those spirits. Um, and so, yes, a lot of... Uh, th- there are things with the transfiguration associated with it uh, and with... Uh, Christ and Moses and Elijah being atop it instead of sort of Baal's uh, council. Uh, that is also the place, it was near Banias where uh, Christ told St. Peter uh, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church and yeah. there were literal gates to Hades that you could point at <laughs> at the time that uh, that Christ said that because uh, it was right after they left Caesarea Philippi, which is uh, right there. So uh, this this is a theme we're going to come back to a lot. Is that yeah. all of these sites in the underworld and in the divine realm that are talked about in Scripture and in other cultures all also correspond to actual physical places? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And they they're, they're seen to the spiritual world. We tend to think of like, well, heaven's up in the sky somewhere and the underworld is down below us. But in actuality, they saw the spiritual world as sort of overlapping uh, with the, the physical world. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for that call, Gareth. Uh, next, we have Michael, who is in Arkansas. And Michael has a question or a comment about polytheism versus monotheism. So, Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you, Father? Good. How are you? Good. Thank God. I have a question for Father Stephen DeYoung. You know, I was told once that there may have been a change at some point in just the way we're, we're educated about religion. And I remember being taught about monotheism and polytheism. And I wonder if in the ancient world it was taught the same way. And how could this maybe contribute to our perceptions when we read gods in the Bible? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I know you asked after Father Stephen, but can I just begin to take a shot at this, if you don't mind? Um, sure, please do. Cause, cause, yeah, yeah, because I mean, he, he's, he's the expert, but I, I do have a couple things I want to throw in here, if only so we can hear him correct me. So, uh, <laughs> um, actually, um, yes. actually, yeah, exactly. Everyone get out your, your animated gifs for that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we today, like Christians today, we tend to, we are monotheists. That's why we talk about it. And, and we're not polytheists. So there's this idea that, that we, we worship the one true God and those pagans, they worship many gods. Right. Um, but that, as you know, if you listen to the beginning of what we were talking about tonight, you know that that's not the, the image that the Bible depicts. It uses the word gods to refer to all kinds of beings and doesn't see a problem with using that same word to refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God. You know, the one true God, that phrase that we use doesn't mean that that's the only being that we use the word God to refer to, because the Bible doesn't do that, right? So this idea of polytheism versus monotheism is actually a relatively later kind of uh, notion in uh, Western intellectual history. Um, and, and you know, the reason why mo the idea of monotheism was kind of come up with is to try to group sets of religions together. So we're monotheists and Jews are monotheists and Muslims are monotheists. And over here you have polytheists, you know, these other kinds of religions. But, but I don't think anyone in the ancient world would have looked at it that way. I mean, that's not the way that religion kind of works and the way people understood it. Um, and, and the question is really not, is there only one God, which is what monotheism means, that there's only one God. We see the Bible doesn't teach only one God. The difference is that there's only one God that you worship. And the other, the other significant difference is that the God whom we worship, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a very different kind of divine being from all these other divine beings, right? So we, you know, like we were talking about atheists earlier who say, well, I just believe in one less God than you do. And it's like, well, no, the, the God that I believe in and worship is a God who is outside of time and space, is the God who created all things, right? Is, is you know, that is a different kind of being, if we can even speak in those terms, from what, how pagans understood what their gods were and you know a pagan god is really a much kind of smaller kind of being and the reason why is it's because a pagan god we're going to talk about this a lot i know a pagan god is a fallen angel right so it, it it is a god in the sense of being a divine spiritual being but it's it's not uh, a god worthy of worship now people do worship them and have worshiped them so that that is what i would say is kind of the big difference between this this you know this idea that we have monotheism and polytheism really what what the the, the picture that the bible de uh, presents is actually not monotheism but rather monolatry meaning there's only one whom we worship you know we, we recognize there are many gods now they're not equal <laughs> they're not equal they're not you know the father son and holy spirit is not the same kind of thing that you know zeus is or hera right uh not at all but 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 the main thing is the main question is how we behave towards them and we're to worship only father son and holy spirit so father stephen do you have any way you wanted to correct that or add that or magnify that or or what not really not really correct it i'll, I'll fill in blanks i don't have to i'm actually you yet um yeah it, it wasn't the the term monotheism was created at the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. It didn't, Which in Orthodox did time is exist. like last week. <laughs> yes. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. even count for Orthodox yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's not that it couldn't. I mean, monos and theos are both Greek words. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, they, they, 
And you do find uh, polytheos in, used as a term by the fathers to refer to pagans. Um, but not monotheos. When, when they talk about the fact that we have uh, one God who we worship, like in the discussions about the Trinity and saying that they weren't tritheists, the term they used was, was uh, monarchia, that there's one archi, one first principle, mm. uh, is how they chose to express themselves. Uh, so monotheism gets invented, and it basically, uh, this whole taxonomy was invented so that we could have this evolutionary view of religion. Uh, and it was created mostly by 19th century liberal German scholars who, not coincidentally, at the end of their taxonomy, discovered that 19th century German liberal Protestantism was the pinnacle of all human religion, right? Like it had evolved <laughs> to them, right? <laughs> and, and so they posit, well, see, polytheism is this sort of primitive thing, and then you kind of outgrow that to monotheism, and they did this whole Hegel thesis antithesis thing where you have, well, you have monotheism and polytheism, and then the synthesis of that is the Trinity or something. Um, and uh, as silly as that sounds, or as silly as I'm making it sound, um, if you or one of your children goes and takes an Old Testament course just about anywhere at a secular university or even most big Christian universities, they will be taught that Israel started out polytheist and evolved into monotheists. Right. And they will quote some of the passages we just quoted and say, oh, see, these are leftovers from back when they were polytheists. And try to set up this sort of, this sort of tax where, where it just sort of evolved, religion just evolved. And that, of course, takes the idea that God revealed himself to humans out of the picture, which is why, which is why we, we uh, would want to have that theory if we're atheists. Um, and so uh, it's important that we not only say, well, look, these categories aren't ancient and aren't original, but that we say uh, that whole taxonomy doesn't work. And a couple of things real quick that refute it are, uh, number one, it depends on the people who put together the Hebrew Bible being both incredibly sophisticated editors and writers and, uh, of, of deep theological truths and being complete imbeciles. Because <laughs> while they were doing all the editing and while they were changing all this stuff to make it look like they were always monotheists, they just missed all these passages. Yeah. Oops. Whoops. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Whoops, we left all this polytheistic stuff yeah. in there. Our bad. Uh, yeah. So that's a problem. And then the other the thing <laughs> to me that really blows it out of the water is that uh, the, t the plural form of gods, talking about gods in the plural, is actually more common in the Dead Sea Scrolls than it is in the Old Testament. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are written right before and during the time of Christ. Yeah. So they clearly hadn't evolved in their language. They were yeah. still talking about, about a plurality of gods. And one yeah. last note on this question, uh, hopefully that's thorough enough, but <laughs> one last note on this question, because I think this is important, is what we mean when we say that there is one true God. Uh, right. What it means to be a true God. Because I think what we hear as modern American Christians, what you hear true God is, oh, well, he's the one that exists and the other ones are fake. Yeah, right, right? exactly. The other ones are made up, right? But... Remember what we were saying earlier in, in our discussion, the idea of being God is the idea of exercising authority and dominion and reign. And so God is the one true God. He is the one who truly holds all authority and power and dominion over the entire creation. Anyone else who has any authority or power or dominion has received it from above, has received it from him, or they don't yes. have it. It's derivative. It's, yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's, yeah. why, that's why we reiterate that in the creed, that Christ is true God. Right? Yep. It's not just that he's God, that he's divine. Right? But, but that he is, he is true God. He exercises the same authority. All right. So, Michael, does that uh, answer your question? 
Yeah, that, that was excellent. I feel a bit misled by our education system, so I appreciate you both clearing that up. For me. Yes. Well, we, we're probably going to do a whole lot of debunking. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you for that, Michael. And, uh, and we've got another good angelic name next, Raphael, uh, who has a question uh, about uh, or comment about guardian angels. So, Raphael, are you there on the line? God, I hope so. <laughs> all right. Welcome, Raphael. <laughs> right on. Thank you, fathers. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the episode. I am blown away so far. Yes. Uh, and and we're just sort of stumbling through this too, like you. Yeah. I'm 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 learning I'm learning how to do this. So so thank you for bearing with us. Oh, absolutely! No, this is fantastic. I I actually have tons of notes already on questions I could ask. But uh, what I was really curious about, uh, since we're talking about angels and demons, uh, is is how how can I deepen my relationship with my guardian angel? Uh, it's something oh, yeah. I've struggled with for the past you know seven eight years. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. So, curious as to what you got to say. It, that that is a good and a very uh, that that's a great question, and re I think really important because, you know, we if you look at the baptismal service, we ask God in the course of that baptismal service to assign a guardian angel to that person, right? So we, you know, and and we don't say that because we just want to say it. We believe that that happens. You know, we don't ask God for things that we don't think are going to happen, you know, especially in services like like baptism. So that that angels are assigned to us to guard us, to help us. Um, so how do you interact more with your angel? Well, um, number one, you know, a lot of prayer books, for instance, will have a, a prayer in there called your, the prayer to your guardian angel. Uh, you know, if you don't have it in your prayer book, then you could probably find an Orthodox prayer to the angel online somewhere I'm, I'm sure that you can find something um and 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 that's something that i would incorporate into your prayer every day but you know one of the things that actually i i don't know why i started doing this um not that long ago i'm kind of ashamed to admit uh within just the past couple of years um as i'm going to sleep you know for, first of course you know we pray to our lord jesus christ to to preserve us and to, to save us, you know, of course, because we could die in our sleep. But also the next thing that I do then is I specifically say, you know, oh, guardian of my uh, guardian of my soul and body, you know, protect from me from all assaults of the evil one this night. And then I also add, because I'm a husband and a father, protect my wife and my children. And I name them in that prayer as I'm going to sleep, because, you know, you go to sleep. That's a kind of a vulnerable position to be in. And you want <laughs> you want, you know, the, 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 the guards up and doing their task in the night mm -hmm. while you're asleep. And, and that's what, the, you know, that is one of the things that we know that the angels do. That's not all that they're about, for sure. We're going to be talking a lot more on this show about what angels are about and, and what Excellent. they do. But, but, but um, one of the things that they do, of course, is to guard us. You know, that they 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 keep us from harm, not just physical harm, but also spiritual harm. Like there is a war going on. There is a war going on. It is a spiritual reality and we're participating in it. Um, we're either participating in the works of God and becoming more like him or we're participating in the works of the devil and becoming more like him. Like I, I one of the one of the, the the biggest aha moments in my conversations with Father Stephen was when he said, you know, that there's there's basically a thing that's the opposite of theosis. You know, that there's, I said, what is that, demonosis? And he's like, well, <laughs> I don't know that there's a word for it specifically. <laughs> but but there is, like, you participate in what God is doing and you become like him. But if you participate in what the dark powers are doing, you become like them, right? So mm. it's you're always headed in one direction or the other. You don't get to stand still. So, uh, you know, how do we participate in, 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 in the reality of our angels? I mean, prayer is the biggest thing, but also just have that sense. I, I think especially when you're going to sleep is a good one. But also, you know, when you wake up in the morning to say, help me today, you know, be with me. It, we're not talking about some kind of flim flammy, you know, I hope angels are watching over you. Like, that, that's OK to say that. Right. But that's kind of not all that they're really about. These are you know god's armies his created beings her his they're his government in a very real sense right um and and part of our task is to become like them 
you know, the Lord says that the sons of the resurrection, yes. this is in, in Luke's gospel, sons of the resurrection become like sons of God and equal to the angels. So we, we, be, we take on their roles. We do the things that they do. So, so yeah, you know, your, your, your guardian angel, your, your patron saint, like the one you're named after, the one who's assigned to your parish, like the, the, the saint mm -hmm. who's assigned to your parish is very concerned with the place that your church is in. Right. So right so uh, I, I think if we just be the beginning is just to acknowledge that like they're here. It, my church is just named after like here in Emmaus. Our church is named for the Apostle Paul. It's not just named after the Apostle Paul. He's here. And this place is important to him because we asked God to assign him here. And so we believe that that happened. Right. So like my, right my, my studio, my studio, I assigned to St. Raphael of Brooklyn. I don't know if you're my named favorite. after him. Yeah, well, there you go. So, right. So he's he's here with me right now and he's here with he's there with you. You know, he's he's doing that. So I, I think those are the key things is is, you know, add that to your regular prayer and and understand that that they are part of your life. You know, they're not they're not just there as a kind of like spiritual technology, like, oh, hey, I need some protection. So I hope the angel shows up. Right. Mm. It, it, but but they're there, you know, they're they're assigned to your to you, to your place, whatever. So I don't know. Father Stephen, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, just a, a couple quick nuances to add. one that you brought out there at the end that that um, it's not just the Frank Peretti version of Guardian Angels, you know, fighting off. Uh, right. Yeah, Anybody I, out there read Frank, Frank Peretti? There's yeah, there was a, there was a, 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 yeah. a, a, a novel series called, oh, man, now I'm, uh, Piercing the Dark. Um, yeah. This Present mm. Darkness and Piercing the Darkness. I read those when I was a kid and it scared me to death yeah. that like there was an angel and uh, there was a demon under my bed or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, man. This is the worst. I bet you we're yeah, going to get a lot of Frank Peretti calls over the over the, the course of the yeah. show. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Father, go ahead. But this role as as angels proper as messengers that they they bring our prayers before God and and uh, and uh, are uh, are part of that communication. Um, beyond uh, the spiritual warfare factor is important, but that yes, that they're um, they're bringing our prayers to God and potentially. Um, although this isn't something we initiate, they can bring messages from God to us. That doesn't mean you summon them up or ask them. Yes, don't do that. Channel them <laughs> or any of that sort of uh, no, new no, age no, no, angel no. channeling stuff. <laughs> right. But, um, but, uh, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then the rest of what, what Father Andrew said. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that call, Raphael. Um, thank you. It's good to have you on. And thank you to everybody who called and to all of those who joined us in the chat room today, to those who emailed us, and even God bless you spammers who showed up in our Facebook event and posted all those ridiculous links that had nothing to do with our show. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for participating, and thank you for bearing with us on this our inaugural episode of the Lord of Spirits podcast. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, God willing, we're going to have uh, a lot more episodes after that, after this. So that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. If you didn't get a chance to call in during the live broadcast, we'd love to hear from you either via email at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com, or you can message us at our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page. And join us for our live broadcast on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't forget to like our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page while you're at it. Leave a recommendation and invite your friends. And if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you get your podcasts, then that raises the visibility of this show and gets more people connected. And finally, finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com slash support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasts stay on the air. Thank you and God bless you.